how do you find love? Until recently, the answers ranged from traditional matchmaking to meeting a partner at work. But now for many, that search starts online. When you're using a dating app, you have to be really open-minded and then you can have like extremely incredible dates and you can have dates where you're like, I definitely wasn't feeling that. So what does all this online romance mean for us in the real world? People have been looking for love online for more than two decades, with the website Match.com launching in 1995 and the gay dating app Grindr launching in 2009. But advertising for a partner goes all the way back to the 17th century, shortly after the advent of the newspaper, when bachelors ran personal ads looking for a suitable companion. It's believed the first woman ran a newspaper ad in 1727, stating she was seeking someone nice to spend her life with. Lonely soldiers during the First World War advertised for pen pals, and in the 1960s, technology got involved. Operation Match was a computer dating service invented by Harvard undergraduates in 1965 that paired people up based on a questionnaire. That all changed in 2012 when Tinder invented the swipe. People swipe right when they like the look of someone or left if they're not so sure. When two people like each other, it's a match and they can then start messaging. Another popular dating app, which allows women to make the first move, followed when ex-Tinder employee Whitney Wolf Heard launched Bumble in 2014. Its parent company, dating group Magic Lab, is now worth $3 billion. The online dating sector as a whole is projected to become a $9 billion industry by 2025. So how have these dating apps and websites changed the way we look for love? I'm here to meet anthropologist Anna Machen to find out. It's a different set of criteria that make up that main value. The big sort of overall way we fall in love hasn't changed that much, to be honest, because obviously it's evolutionarily incredibly ancient. Um, so the actual neurochemistry that goes on, the things that we find attractive hasn't changed. But what dating apps have done is they've, in a way, changed the way we search. When you get a connection, when you get a match, you get a dopamine hit. You feel good about yourself. Somebody likes me. That's great. And so, and dopamine is addictive. Users splurged more than $2.2 billion on dating apps in 2019, with Chinese app Tantan seeing the fastest growth. But it's Tinder that leads the way for overall spend, with its upgrade and subscription options generating the most income. Users parted with so much money within the app in the past decade that it came second only to Netflix in terms of consumer spend. But does all of that money mean people are finding their soulmate? Well, according to a 2016 study, more than a third of men on Tinder swipe right on every image they see. We're seeing these very extreme behaviours of men fancying everybody and women being very, very picky about who they then actually try and like, because otherwise it's just not working for them. Match Group, which owns Tinder, Match.com and OkCupid, is the biggest player in the online dating space. The company, which is listed on Nasdaq, made revenues of more than $2 billion in 2019. More niche apps are also springing up focused on sexual orientation, religion, preference for facial hair, or people living in rural areas. And there's Lumen, a new dating app for people over 50, which is owned by Magic Lab, the parent company of Bumble. We'd realised that there was a growing number of over 50s who um, had seen that there were dating sites supposedly designed for them, found them quite old fashioned, wanted to be using dating apps, but then most of the dating apps that were out there were designed for millennials. We knew that there were um, men in their 50s and 60s who want to date women the same age as them, so we decided to create a place where you know that everyone on the app is over 50. While apps have certainly had an impact on dating, they've also been blamed for encouraging a so-called hookup culture and some people aren't so sure about them. The swiping feels like quite depressing, so like every time you swipe through it's like you're looking for a better person. It's almost like the there's too many people there. Males are always like a lot dominant on the app and like they kind of like keep on swiping and get less matches. However, females are like getting a lot of matches. They have to like filter through a lot of stuff. I get messages from people that are completely different than anything that somebody would say in real life. Knowing that I feel like I can go home and swipe and find someone else. You equally know that the other person can do that too. I feel like it's the same people on all of them. Um, they're just different user experiences. My hope is that I'll just meet someone in real life. If you're looking for something long term, Charlie Lester has this advice. 
I think one of the key things with dating is making sure that you're in the right headspace to be using a dating app. If you're not feeling particularly confident in yourself, then being rejected potentially by complete strangers can actually have a real effect on you. I speak to a lot of people who, they, the way they talk about dating, it just feels quite arduous and like it's become this, really this, this nighttime job that they feel they have to do every night. And it shouldn't feel like that. I mean, if you don't have enough time to be, to be dating, then you probably don't have enough time for a relationship. As dating apps are relatively new, academics are only just starting to understand people's behaviour on them, and there's a whole load of new terminology to describe what they're up to. Ghosting refers to someone who breaks off all communication and contact with no warning, while breadcrumbing is when a potential date sends endless messages but never wants to meet up, a bit like a pen pal. There are some people who use dating apps who aren't necessarily there to find a match, but they are competitively seeing how many matches they get. They're called collectors, and they are simply there to boost their own self-esteem, maybe, by getting however many matches a day. There's another new term that's come out called obliga swiping, which is you swipe, and then you can tell yourself you're doing something to find a partner, but you actually never ever take it any further. But among the new swiping apps, there's still a place for the more traditional matching technique. Dating website eHarmony uses a detailed questionnaire. We basically then match you according to these 32 uh, dimensions. Uh, basically deep uh, kind of personality and, and value traits that we think are really important. We're getting to that tipping point very soon where uh, the majority of people we will meet online. I think we predicted uh, around 2035 that would be the case. What's been the impact of the new apps on eHarmony? They have brought into the category uh, a whole bunch of uh, new users that wouldn't have necessarily thought about doing online dating in the past. Over time and as maybe you know a bit of uh, swiping fatigue starts to appear and these people's needs change and they start looking for something a bit different, very often we see them uh, coming to, to your harmony. So what will technology mean for dating in the future? And will we ever go back to meeting people in real life? This neurochemistry of attraction isn't released when you are looking at uh, an image online, when you're texting, when you're WhatsApping, all these things, you're not getting that. People are starting to go back to what they call old-fashioned dating because they are realising that actually all that swiping, particularly if you're a woman, um, doesn't necessarily end up with a pool of men who's necessarily right for you. Because they're so visual, they are much more male-friendly than female-friendly. And I think we might start to see apps which really do encourage a cut down on the endless uh, remote texting. Thanks for watching. Are you a collector or have you been guilty of breadcrumbing? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe.